Love to call the meeting to order. It's November 18th of the Deschutes County Board of Commissioners. Um, Commissioner Henderson is not here today. He is um, under the weather. Um, we'll begin by doing our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's see. I don't believe we have any citizen imp input today. Is are there any citizens in the audience that wanted to make any statements? You need to fill out a blue form. Um, okay, I, I see none at the time then, so we will dispense with that. We have a consent agenda. Consent agenda, a couple items. Uh, yeah, easement for uh, internet and uh, uh, a special road district, but also the minutes. I do have a proposed edit to the minutes, pretty simple structural change. So it's just uh, our um, public hearing on lower bridge development, so it's just uh, mentioning Mr. Daniels, and then the next sentence uh, refers to Wallace Group, which was Mr. Daniels, not Wallace Group, who had invest invested money over time. Uh, so with that, I've highlighted it, and I'll hand it to Sharon. With that, I'll move the consent agenda. And I will second the motion. Um, all in favor? Commissioner DeBoe? Yes. And Commissioner Adair, yes. So thank you very much. Okay, our first action item this morning is Consideration of board signature, um, a ten of award. And Cody, would you love to join us? Good morning, Cody Smith, Road Department. Uh, Road Department prepared solicitation documents for a 7,040 square foot metal building to be constructed at the uh, South County campus in Lapine uh, to house our uh, our road sanding material stockpile down there. So this building would keep that material dry and, and free from snow and ice during the winter months when we use it. Um, the department received one bid from the, for the project from Pacific Construction and Development. Uh, their bid was in the amount of $329,900. Uh, the department's estimate for this project was only $250,000. Um, because the lowest and only bid exceeded our estimate, the department entered into negotiations with the uh, low bidder to solicit cost savings and value engineering. Uh, the department has negotiated a contract amount of $284,930. Before you this morning is a notice of intent to award the contract to Pacific Construction and Development. Um, upon approval, the notice would begin a one-week protest period. If no protests are received, the contract will be awarded administratively. So this, this, this contract amount is uh, $34,930 over um, our estimate and over what we budgeted. So um, more than likely would also warrant a, a budget adjustment prior to the end of the fiscal year in that amount. Great. So this is uh, going to be a big old building on that property down there. Uh, land use inside the city now because I think of a the landscape management review which we put a lot of folks through but this is land use in the city of Lapine uh, also this is is this kind of the footprint of existing um, sand storage areas so this is where we've traditionally done the business of sand storage that's correct and, and we've already gotten all our, our land use approval and permit okay. from the city of Lapine for this project great well, because I've heard back from some of the contractors, how can you make these big piles there when we're, you know, that some other contractors have to go through land use sometimes when they, they do this. But, yeah, so in the city of Lapine, that's been worked out, so that's good. Uh, well, in, in light of uh, yeah, just construction and uh, uh, contractors being available, this seems, uh, you know, appropriate, a little bit more than expected. Uh, is this going to be kind of an I-beam construction building, just a large metal yeah, it's a metal metal frame building, um, metal siding. Yeah, um, front and back pretty much stay open, so loader can get in and out. The cover. Yep. Great. Well, I'm supportive. Um, I'm glad you were able to negotiate it. But, you know, it was originally what seventy nine thousand over your original estimate, and why do you think we didn't get any other bids? <clears throat> Are people just that busy? They so yeah, I mean, we and we we sat down and talked about it with this particular contractor. I mean, yeah, everybody's plate's kind of full. This, this bidder uh, even uh, it was pretty late in the advertisement period before he decided, ah, well, nobody else is biting on this. I might as well throw a number in. So 
um, yeah, I, I think I think biggest part of it is um, is just our current market. Building contractors are busy right now. Um, this 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 project was uh, very uh, very well advertised, and despite that, uh, around the state and even around south southern Washington and northern California, and despite that, we only got the one bid. Well, I, this is kind of the next size up for a, a pole barn company in our local area, too, you know, being the, the big I-beam structures. Uh, so what's the time frame for construction? Would it be this in the spring? or? Uh, yeah, so the contract completion date on this is, is June 30th, so we, we'd anticipate uh, getting this awarded. They'd probably probably go to work in the spring, have it completed. So, so we'd have the building in place and ready to use next for next winter. We utilize existing piles, open up clear out and then let them be able to do their thing great yeah we, we've already stockpiled our, our sanding materials mm -hmm. for this winter, for this winter. So, i hope yeah. so yeah because yeah. <laughs> yep. you never know i mean just remember that february 25th or 24th snowstorm wasn't really projected to be huge so yeah it's nice to have stockpiles with that i'll move board chair signature of document number 2019-739 uh, in the amount of two hundred eighty-four thousand nine hundred thirty dollars, uh, for uh, to Pacific Construction and Development for a Lapine Sand Shed project. And I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? Commissioner DeBone. Yes. Commissioner Dare. Yes. Thank, Thank you, Cody. You. Thank you. Um, Zachariah. Good morning. Good morning. Rolling right along. All right, a couple of things to hand out here. This is for you. It'll be a script to open up for the record during the public hearing. Yes, I was wondering about all that. Yeah. Mm. Oh boy. And then we we received a public comment from Thousand Friends of Oregon this morning, 15, 30 minutes ago. So I'll hand this out so it can be part of your packet moving forward. We'll make sure you have your later so you can copy as well. I'm not supposed to say this. Yep. I no, am. No. You are not. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> Just With it, it's yellow. Yeah. Okay, because I thought Commissioner Henderson sometimes said that. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, because he usually he had in the past. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and it looks like this computer is not turned on, so it'll take a moment to power up. Um, with that said, I, um, I'll introduce myself, uh, Zechariah Heck, Associate Planner with the Community Development Department, the case planner for the Non-Prime Resource Lands Amendment, the uh, subject of the public hearing today. So, uh, Vice Chair Adair, if we want to, or if you would like to, proceed with um, opening up the record, we can run through this script. Um, recognizing that, that Commissioner Henderson is not present today, it's my understanding that we will continue the public hearing uh, to a date certain. Um, so in recognizing that there's at least one individual here that may uh, provide public comment, um, I I ask the board if you're interested in me running through my full PowerPoint presentation. Um, it is, it is um, 
fairly lengthy. It's added uh, about a, 10 or more slides from what we discussed at our work session. Um, so I can, I can run through that or we can just wait for that until Commissioner Henderson, <clears throat> excuse me, returns and um, review that as well, so. Okay, Commissioner Henderson did say that he would be watching. Okay. He could watch. So I, I don't know. Um, uh, since it's video, I mean, I don't see any downside in kind of doing the full introduction at this right. point. I mean, what you, we scheduled it and kind of queued up for all that, so. Would it legal agrees that it's okay if we watch it today? Yeah, actually, I think if, if, if Commissioner Henderson's in fact watching and he'll have the ability to watch this, he could probably do the full presentation now. And even if the board continues the hearing to mm -hmm. a second uh, a second date, you could probably do a more summary one at that time. Okay. I think staff was thinking more in terms of the, the next item, the Thornburg deliberations, that those might need to be short-circuited today in order to have full deliberations with Commissioner Henderson next week. Okay. Yeah, so I like the idea of just kind of laying this all out there and, uh, you know, with the intention of, uh, you know, possibly not closing it up like we could have in the past, but that's fine. Okay. Or without Commissioner Henderson. Okay, sounds good. So while this computer boots up, um, Vice Chair Adair and I will run through the opening script. Sound good? Yes. Okay. This is the time and place set for hearing on file number 247. Dash 19 dash 00265 PA concerning amendments to the comprehensive plan that establish eligibility criteria for non prime resource lands, also known as non resource lands under Oregon Administrative Rule. The Board of County Commissioners will hear oral testimony, receive written testimony, and consider the testimony submitted at this hearing. The hearing is also being taped. The board may make a decision on this matter today, continue the public hearing to a date certain, or leave the written record open for a specified period of time. The hearing will be con conducted in the following order. Staff will give a report on this issue. We will then open the hearing to all present and ask people to present testimony at one of the tables or at the podium. You can also provide the commission with a copy of written testimony. Questions to and from the chair may be entertained at any time at the chair's discretion. Cross-examination of people testifying will not be allowed. However, if any person wishes to ask a question of any other person during that person's testimony, please direct your question to the chair after being recognized. The chair is free to decide whether or not to ask such questions of the person testifying. Prior to the commitments, commencement of the hearing, any party may challenge the qualifications of any commissioner for conflict of interest. This challenge must be, con must be documented with specific reasons supported by facts. Should any commissioner be challenged, the member may disqualify himself or herself, withdraw from the hearing, or make a statement on the record of their capacity to hear and decide this issue. At this time, do any members of the commission need to set forth any information that may be perceived as a conflict of interest? Does any commissioner have anything to disclose? And if so, please state the name, nature of same and whether you can proceed. So uh, uh, just as an experienced commissioner, I've had people come to me over the years and ask and learn about uh, land use and how, you know, how or why we would put uh, you know, subset of people that live on these properties through this process. So I've learned about it, but there's no conflict directly. I don't live on any of these lands, or, and they are in the rural county, so I have none. And um, I also have no conflict, so thank you. Does any party wish to challenge any commissioner based on biases or conflicts? Okay, as no challenges are presented, the hearing is now open. Staff will proceed with a brief report. Thank you. A uh, few housekeeping items. I wanna let the audience know that there are several hard copies of the findings as well as the proposed amendments, um, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation at the table to the right as soon as you walk in the door. And to begin, I'll explain by um, describing what non-prime resource lands are. They are known as non-resource lands under Oregon Administrative Rule. 
and they have an exceedingly low capacity to be managed for commercial agriculture and or forest activities. <coughs> Excuse me. They do not meet state agricultural land or forest land definitions due to poor soil conditions, lack of irrigation, climate conditions, and other factors including past use. Non-resource lands have been a legacy issue in Deschutes County for some time. In the 1970s, when zoning was applied to land throughout the county, we used uh, soil maps, the limited availability of soil maps, um, to determine, help determine where resource zoning should apply. Non-urban, undeveloped, and uncommitted lands were zoned EFU or forest use. This led to inaccurate zoning designations and to address this issue, the county has participated in legislative, legislative processes since 2008 to update the land designations. In March of this year, the board directed staff to initiate amendments to establish a non-prime resource lands program. The original amendments had two proposals. Proposal one focused on recognizing six specific areas that are residentially committed and have inaccurate zoning designations. I'll show a map here shortly identifying those areas. Proposal two formally acknowledged the non-resource lands process allowed by state law and supplemented the state's criteria with local criteria that speaks to the lay of the land in Deschutes County's local values. The Planning Commission was the first uh, county body to, to review the amendments we held three open houses throughout the county and had two public hearings and several deliberations. Eventually, the Planning Commission recommended approval of proposal number one to the Board of County Commissioners. Throughout the open houses and public hearing, there were significant public comments and testimony on these amendments. However, a vast majority of the public comments uh, pertain to number proposal number two, the general eligibility criteria rather than proposal one, what we are discussing today, the six specific residentially committed areas. With that said, most of the public comments uh, described can be summarized in this slide where we have support for the amendments because they allow zoning flexibility, reduced regulatory burden and uh, cost for proceeding with developing a house or addition in these areas. There was also significant comments in opposition to the proposed amendments stating that the amendments undermine the land use system, our state's land use system. They have uh, impacts to wildlife. They impact the rural lifestyle of these areas. And uh, several er uh, members of the public also mentioned concerns about access. All comments have been provided to you uh, both in a hard copy binder that is available to the board as well as your meeting packet. And for anybody watching online, they are available online at deschutes.org forward slash NPR. Here's one copy of the binder here for, that was put up here. Following the public hearings in front of the Planning Commission in October, the board directed staff to formally separate the NPR land amendments into two distinct proposals. Uh, schedule amendments correcting the six specific areas committed to residential areas um, for a board work session and public hearing. That's what we're doing today. And then following up with the Planning Commission to discuss the general eligibility criteria at a later date. That brings us here today for our first public hearing on proposal number one. This slide identifies a map or depicts a map that shows the six areas committed to residential areas. We have Squaw Creek Canyon Recreational States up in the North County, Skyline Subdivision and First Edition due west of the city of Bend, Meadowcrest Acres, Hainer Park and Section 36 all in South County. These areas represent 237 lots, 110 are vacant, and approximately 900 are or approximately 900 acres, so a very, very small portion of the entire county. The, the comprehensive plan amendments uh, both amend 
create new goals and new policies throughout the comprehensive plan, both in land use or in land use planning, agricultural lands, forest lands, our introduction, rural development, rural housing, and then a brand new section 3.11 non-prime resource lands. So we have two amended policies, agricultural land in sections agricultural lands and rural housing, two new goals and 10 new policies in that new section 3.11. I'll go over the proposed amendments in the ne these next few slides. Um, I won't read them verbatim. These slides do uh, describe them in verbatim, but I'll uh, orally just provide a brief summary. Policy 2.2.3 clarifies the non-prime, non-resource land amendments are allowed per state statute, Oregon administrative rules, and as proposed in the comprehensive plan. Policy 2.3.13 acknowledges the non-prime resource lands program, the county's comprehensive plan um, has or uh, creates for the forest use. So the only difference between policy 2.2.3 and this policy, one speaks agricultural lands and the other one speaks to forest lands. Policy 3.3.1 and 3.3.2 Recognize that land divisions are not allowed in this in these six areas today, and moving forward, they are not proposed to uh, to be further divided either. So it sets a minimum parcel size of 10 acres. This is standard throughout the county, um, albeit that most of these areas uh, are well below the minimum parcel size of 10 acres. They are all legal lots. Um, however, that minimum lot parcel size just sets a minimum. And then we have a specific policy that states further land division divisions are would not are prohibited in the non-prime resource lands 10 zone. So just a kind of an acknowledgement. So the existing parcelized areas that are proposed are are there known any parcels that are larger than 20 acres in there? There are a few in section 36. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah, so you have to go to 20 or more to be able to divide the 210. So it's right. not a 10-acre minimum. Basically, it's 20 or more to get to that minimal uh, or, uh, division. Correct. And another thing to add on to that uh, excellent point, Commissioner DeBone, is that in Section 36, there's a wildlife area combining zone that further limits what types of land divisions are allowed. So we're just we're keeping the status quo with these proposed amendments. In the new section 3.11, non-prime resource lands, our first goal is simply to allow the designation of non-prime resource lands. 3.11.1 uh, states that property owners can continue to apply through a quasi-judicial process for a rezone from EFU or forced use to non-resource zone consistent with state law. We want to make sure that we don't close the door on anybody uh, through these proposed amendments. To date, Deschutes County has approved six quasi-judicial amendment comp plan, quasi-judicial plan amendment zone change applications, and so we want to make sure that that availability is still open down the road. Goal number two is to resolve resource zoning restrictions applied to subdivisions prior to statewide planning legislation taking effect in Deschutes County. Policy 3.11.2 is essentially the purpose statement for the, the new section. Policy 3.11.3 states a single family dwelling or manufactured home and their accessory uses shall be permitted outright. This is uh, one of the, the key components of the, the new or the proposed amendments and the new zone that, that may follow these amendments is that we recognize these areas are committed to residential uses. We want to allow uh, the vacant properties to um, not be burdened with the, the regulations and the financial cost of going through a land use application to develop their residential property. Policy 3.11.4 lists out the six specific areas committed to residential uses. And again, policy 3.11.5 
again, specifies that those six specific areas are not eligible for land divisions. Policy 3.11.6 and 3.11.7 uh, speak to the, the six areas. The first one, uh, 3.11.6, recognizes the EFU properties. Um, so we this is where really the, the legal argument is in these proposed amendments. Deschutes County understands that these areas do contain marginal soils that could be classified as class six um, soils. But besides that point, they, they're unsuitable for farm or forest use based on the land use history and whether a reasonable farmer would put these lands to agriculture or, or forestry uses. Again, they have small average lot size, approximately one acre in the majority of these areas. Lots are individually owned and mostly developed. There is no history or farm or forest activities. There's little to no access to irrigation, and it's impractical to incorporate these areas into adjacent EFU parcels given their lot size, lot patterns, residential development, and multiple ownerships. Squaw Creek, though, does have their lots are 2.5 acres average. Yeah, just just above. Yes. Yeah. Just Mo most, I believe, Meadow or Squaw Creek has an uh, average lot size of 2, and then Section 36 has an average lot size of 11. 11 plus, yeah, 11.65. Policy 3.11.8 ensures the status quo until an NPR 10 zone is adopted. As allowed today, property owners can continue to apply through a quasi-judicial process as I mentioned earlier. So again, we want to make sure that we just are not closing the door on anybody uh, for the board and any, anybody listening online. So the, the process that we're looking at here is we're proposing amendments today to the comprehensive plan. These provide the ingredients essentially to bake the cake, which would be the NPR 10 zone. If these amendments are formally acknowledged and approved, we will get, then go through a, a second iteration, which will be a, another public process where we will engage the public, the Planning Commission, as well as the board to come up with a, an NPR 10 zone that we would then, the county would then apply to these six specific areas. And so again, we have several policies that just um, make sure that there are, are property owners out there that are still able to go through the status quo um, in that in-between time period. All right, a quick summary of the proposed amendments. The, the proposed policies state these areas are not suitable, not suitable for farm or forest uses. Again, small average lot size, marginal soils at best, lack of irrigation committed to residential uses. When, uh, if we re redesignate these areas, we will not impact neighboring farm or forest uses. The Planning Commission and staff toured all of these areas and got a lay of the land and understood that there are no commercial farm or forestry activities going on in these areas, nor in the, the nearby adjacent lands. It will not impact wildlife habitat uh, because com residential uses are allowed today, albeit through a uh, conditional use process. Moving forward, we're removing that conditional use process, still allowing residential uses, but no further land divisions. It's, again, just removing that regulatory and burden, that financial hardship for these property owners. And again, to be super clear, these six specific areas only apply to the six aforementioned um, areas. During our work session, the board expressed some interest in um, learning more about uh, the financial impact of having these areas designated under a resource zone as they are today. This slide provides a, a summary of that. So a conditional use permit for a non-farm dwelling, our permit costs are $3,600. For a forest dwelling, it's $2,900 approximately. Even for an alteration of an EFU dwelling, so that is the dwelling that is lawfully permitted. It's clear 
but they're adding on to the footprint of that dwelling, we are still required to go through uh, a land use application to show that they comply with, with state rules. For us to do that, we charge a $530 application. Soil scientists are often required for a plan amendment zone change application to show that a specific property does not have farmable or forest soils. To hire a soil scientist, there's only a few throughout the state and their costs can range from $4,000 to $10,000. Of course, depending on the size of the area they are studying. And lastly, if a property owner proposes an application that is contested or there is opposition, the county requires a deposit, a hearings officer deposit for that application to be reviewed by an independent land use attorney. That cost or that deposit is five thousand five hundred dollars and again that but that's at the cost or at cost of service so when you total all these up um, oh the last thing I, I skipped over there is um, a consultant oftentimes property owners aren't well versed in land use and so they seek the help of a consultant typically we chat, chatted with um, some consultants as well as our current planning staff and consultants typically charge whatever that permit fee is. Um, so 3,600 for a non-farm dwelling. You add up all these together and you're ranging anywhere from uh, 12 to $20,000 to, to get um, just to a yes in order to apply for building permits uh, for these areas. One thing I'll also add in these six specific areas, as far as we can review, um, every application that has come forward for new residents has been approved because the, the evidence is so clear that these areas are not farm or forest parcels. Commissioner Henderson um, expressed some interest in understanding the valuation of these properties to understand what, what we're opening up, what we're trying to um, allow, who we're um, focusing on these proposed amendments. The next few slides help paint that picture. Um, I'll go through them uh, quickly here and uh, when the public hearing is continued with Commissioner Henderson, if he has any further questions or if the commissioners today have any further questions, happy to answer that, uh, those questions. So in Skyliner subdivision and Skyliner first edition, the median improved valuation of these properties. So uh, the real market value of the properties that are developed with the residents, the median price is 300,000. For a vacant property, we're looking at $167,000 for real, real market value. Squaw Creek Canyon Recreational Estates uh, jumps up to a median value of 650,000. That's for improved properties. And for a vacant property, uh, we're looking at 150,000. Section 36, a little bit of a different story here. We have a median improved valuation of 250,000 approximately, and then down to 36,000 for a vacant property in section 36. In Meadowcrest, the valuation of an improved property is 165,000. A vacant property is 40,000. Hainer Park, we're looking at 250,000 for a median improved property, and vacant is 100,000. And with that, I'm here to answer any questions the board might have, um, as well as I'll mention for anybody listening online. We do have a project website with the information available, uh, deschutes.org forward slash NPR. My information is available on the screen as well as on that website. Maybe just some words around, so uh, non-prime resource land. That is something that was kind of coined here for Deschutes County. Uh, non-resource land is kind of the other designation, resource or non-resource. Uh, so non-prime resource is the terminology Deschutes County is using is, is the acknowledgement. Uh, so it is kind of creating that middle ground, acknowledging the current conditions on the ground. Exactly. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions? Or? It is interesting to look at the valuation spread. You know, um, it goes from like 
to two and a half times, six times um, Section 36 is much more valued when it has been improved. Mm -hmm. So if this, you know, could be an asset for that area. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Vice Chair Adair, my, my understanding is that there there isn't anybody that will. T oh, there's there's at least one. Okay, <laughs> I she came in late, so <clears throat> yeah, we can now open it to the. Uh, public hearing, but um, what my understanding is, we'll have a continued public hearing for Commissioner Henderson. So. Correct. Okay. Okay. So we would like to open the, the public hearing now. If you would care to come and um, please identify yourself. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Carol Macbeth, and I'm the, one of the staff attorneys for Central Oregon Land Watch. Thank you for the opportunity to comment this morning. Our concern is that the proposal does not comply with the statewide land use planning goals. As you'll maybe remember from 1973, Tom McCall made an address to the legislature January 8, 1973, in which he decried the uncontrolled development across the state. He said that the greatest threat to the quality of life of Oregonians was uncontrolled development. He said that when hardworking Oregonians come home at the end of the day after making a living, they should come back to a place worth living in. And he made several points about the, the quality of our agricultural land base and our forest land base and how important those industries are. And as a result of his urgings and also the urgings of Hector McPherson, who was a senator and a farmer in the Willamette Valley, the legislature responded by uh, uh, setting up the system that we have today. LCDC created 19 goals and our system is organized around those goals. That the system if, um, has, has a goal for farmland called goal three and it'll, it says what uses will be allowed on farmland and what uses won't. And there's this, a goal four and that says what uses will be allowed on forest land and what uses won't. And the reasoning behind that is that as an industrial land base, the forest industry and the farming industry cannot operate if they have to go around a bunch of obstacles. When the land base is fragmented, it no longer functions for what it's supposed to. So every, every comprehensive plan in the state was acknowledged by the LCDC as in compliance with those statewide planning goals. When the county first did theirs, it was 1979. There's been a few iterations since. This is a proposed amendment to the plan, and just like the original plan and the amended plans, this amendment also has to comply with the 19 land use planning goals, but it doesn't, and that's what our concern is here. That this concept of non-prime resource lands, as Chairman DeBone pointed out, that's a, that's a term that Deschutes County may use internally, but it, there is no such thing as non-prime resource lands. There are 19 goals, Amendments have to comply with those goals. If the county wishes to put things to uses that aren't in the goals, then they need an exception to the goals. That's the system that has been set up. There's, there's goals, there's rules, um, there's statutes that apply to these concepts. And the county can achieve these objectives. They can allow these uses if they can sh take an exception and prove it. Or they could do what's called a non-resource designation or a redesignation of all of the lands in the county but they can't just do it piece by piece as being proposed here. There's a system, it's outlined in ORS 215788, and these are the, this is the system in which the county is operating. The, the goals are mandatory and binding on Deschutes County, so it can't just go out and create a concept of non-prime resource lands, which cuts across several goals and, and is contravention of those goals and expected to be approved. In particular, um, the, the six areas under consideration, as the proposal states, those are resource lands, right? They're, they're zoned F1, they're zoned F2, they're zoned EFU. So they are resource lands. And then it has to be shown that, they, that taking these uses and putting them in on those lands complies with goal three. But the proposal doesn't address goal three. And that's a problem that has to be addressed before it could be approved. 
Um, the, the exception process is very specific. There's three different types. There's committed and reasons exceptions. Um, I don't know which one that the county would be going for, but, um, but that's the only way to get the uses unless the county redesignates its farm and forest lands, which is, again, under the, the um, statute ORS 215-788 and the sequential statutes following it. The county stated that it's only adopting goals and policies, but it's not. It's trying to say that these farm and forest lands aren't farm and forest lands, but it's not doing so under ORS 215-788. So um, that in conclusion, I'd just like to say that this isn't going to fit in with the, the statewide planning goals, and so it can't be approved. Um, and we attached a letter from DLCD from 2015. I think it was January. Uh, in 2015 in which DLCD explained to the county that this approach is not consistent with the goals and wouldn't be possible. So we attached that letter for your information. DLCD has already considered it. The LCDC is the one that would have to approve the approach and, and they've already said that they wouldn't. So that was um, almost five years ago. We attached it and we also attached our May 23rd comments to you on this topic. But I'd just like to point out that in Skyliners, that area in particular, it wouldn't be a good idea to allow outright uses there for houses because of the fire risk. Those should always go through a conditional use permit. And um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So these were parcelized lands before land use. I mean, do you think it was the intention of the legislature and the governor at the time to lock out these things with this single monolithic system? So many years later with the population growth we've had, these are privately owned parcels that people come to us and say, why can't I build a house on my small five acre parcel in this rural area? Uh, so, I mean, this is just a natural conflict. Uh, if you've heard me probably in uh, uh, meetings before saying this was the catch-all at the time. And we, I, I, I would assume I wasn't there. 1979, this was the catch-all. Well, let's, let's stop for now because we've done so much work on the initial comprehensive plan and zoning. Uh, we'll get back to it someday. And that was the 79, 80s, and now we're 30 and 40 years later. So, I mean, yeah, it's nice to be able to hold on to this system and what the vision might have been, but it, it's not evolving with the times. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think lines? the legislature did take that idea into, the, into account in, in developing ORS 215-788. That is, that if the lands were incorrectly zoned or incorrectly uh, categorized, then there's a process for going back and changing that. But that's not what is proposed here. So there is a way to do that. If, if they were miscategorized, the county just follows that process. But this isn't that process. So what we're saying and what DLCD has said before is that that's, there is a process. The legislature set it up in response to concerns just like those. And so the county, if they want to do it, they just follow ORS 215-788. We don't know why the county's not taking that route. Also, you might point out that, yeah, there's, there are ways to get dwellings on resource lands. They're just, um, they might not like them, but, I mean, people who bought land, there may be people who bought prior to, you know, 1979, but, um, but the lands have been zoned the way they are since 1979. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, welcome. Thank you very much. Yes, sure. that was 40 years ago. So, yes, thank you. Yeah, you might not remember that address to Tom, from Tom McCall. No. Uh, was in Perry. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we had 1973. Yeah, that was a while back. Um, definitely. Is there any other further testimony? Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. So, Zachariah, if we have no further testimony, um, we do want to keep this open for Commissioner Henderson. So I support keeping the oral record open. You know, this is a good beginning point today, and uh, thank you for the testimony, and uh, we can uh, take more oral and written, I'd support. And I, I concur with yep. that. Okay. And uh, so then we should set a date certain for continued, um, for a continued public hearing uh, Zach, if I could ask, yeah. um, I don't know that there's any great urgency, and I know their board is just loaded the next month, month and a half, so maybe this could mm -hmm. get pushed out a little ways. Um, not try to push it in December, or maybe even January. You might be looking at February. They've got an awful lot on their plate, and this really, um, I just don't see the urgency of getting it done in the next month or two. Okay. And it's going to really burden the board and their limited time right now. 
Yeah, and I support slipping it past the first of the year. You can just see the holidays coming up and the different, uh, you know, uh, activities. So, uh, you know, setting a date certain is the goal here. But, yeah, there, I would agree, no rush. So, unfortunately, this calendar doesn't yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't go to next year. We've been working on 40 <laughs> years, so what's, what's another two months? Well, I'll just, yeah, just suggest you folks, your workload's yeah. just in, yeah. incredible. And so yeah. if, if we can maybe push it out till mid-January, that might be better. Okay. I don't know if someone has a calendar. So, yeah, Wednesday, the yep. third week of January on Wednesday. That, that? If that works, yeah. What was that date? 15th or 22nd? Second January 15th. The middle, yeah, that's fine. There you go. Okay. January 15th. So the public hearing will be continued to January 15th in this room, 10 a.m., and the record obviously remains open as well during that window. Okay. All right. That's good. I will make sure the project website reflects that um, continued public hearing on the 15th of January. Thank you. We'll see you in the new year then. Thank you, Zachary. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Jacob. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jacob Ripper. I'm a senior planner with the CDD. Uh, today we did um, have it scheduled for deliberations for the appeal of the Thornburg first phase hearings officer's decision on remand. Um, understanding that we're short um, one board member today, I understand that we wanted to continue the deliberations until next Monday. Um, just a note that um, we're going to have a really tight turnaround for that final decision with uh, the county and the mailing services being closed most of that week. So um, we'll have to get a decision in the mail by Wednesday. By Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. The board is scheduled for Monday, and then you would have the option of, of continuing Monday's uh, meeting to Tuesday or Wednesday or both if it turns out. And, and right. that would be a continuation of that current Monday meeting, so there aren't notice issues. We do provide notice to the media, okay. but... So that it would be a continuation of a meeting, not a new meeting. And we do have a very, at least we have a light schedule on Tuesday if we need to have a meeting, so, and Wednesday too, so if it's necessary. Yep. Well, and uh, understanding that concept of continuing a meeting, so we'll, we'll definitely set up for Monday when we, uh, a week, two weeks from now, um, or a week from now, I guess. Yeah, yes, sorry. It's Monday. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, continuation to possibly Tuesday could be very valuable at that point. Actually, uh, commissioners, we have nothing scheduled for either Tuesday or Wednesday currently. Okay. So, I mean, we could uh, yep. set something up, but there would be nothing for, that, for this to conflict with on either Tuesday okay. or Wednesday. But we have to have the document in the mail by Wednesday, so we would probably want to do it. If we don't complete it on Monday, we'll have to do it on Tuesday in order to get that document. Timely. Tuesday would be best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Well, For so you, I, I would a, suggest if you want Thanksgiving dinner. I could see a Monday meeting and possible Tuesday extension, but mm -hmm. sure. sure. Okay. Good. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. So. Um, I can note that for your, not, your uh, one o'clock scheduled item, Mr. Doty's here and could handle that if the board's so inclined. I don't okay. know if anybody from Terrebonne was planning to attend that. It was, I don't know if you've heard of anything, Chris, from. No. <coughs> so it's, it's the board's pleasure. I will note that it's a meeting item and not a hearing, so times right. are approximate, and, and you're not obligated to honor the 1 o'clock time. If it was a hearing, that'd be different, but it's a, just a public meeting matter. Well, and I support that because, I mean, this, you know, whatever decisions or discussions made is available to any interested parties on that, and, uh, yeah, I do support that. So for the next, uh, both items. Okay, Mr. Dowdy. Well, good morning, board. Thank you for uh, holding this one a little earlier. Sent me a trip back. Hmm. Uh, we met in August uh, to discuss the wastewater 
uh, system feasibility uh, talk uh, that's uh, happening in Terrebonne. Uh, the board had received uh, some community input at the time from some folks who were concerned about their septic systems failing and options and uh, you know a, a gentleman uh, owning a local business had uh, kind of gathered some community support um, and, and has basically asked the, the board to consider updating the 1999 uh, feasibility study that was uh, put together and, and uh, before the community 20 years ago. So that time uh, when we met in August, the board directed staff to develop a request for proposals document, an RFP, um, to, issue, or to issue out on the street and basically update that 1999 study. And uh, not only that, but evaluate maybe some other options and things that, uh, that could be evaluated today that weren't available in, uh, in 1999. So uh, such as in, in a cluster system concept as well. So with that, I can uh, kind of walk you through uh, the uh, the RFP uh, that you have in your packet there uh, put it put it uh, two phases basically the uh, scope elements and um, kind of walk you through some of that uh, in the first phase uh, item number one uh, we're asking this consultant to develop a communication strategy you know obviously a concept study for a new utility uh, that where one does not exist uh, it involves a, a very significant community conversation and the ability to communicate, get the word out. This community ultimately is going to be deciding, you know, do they want to, to have a new, have a, have a sewer system and evaluate the cost. So, um, you know, I think we're very familiar with community processes in Terrebonne uh, of late, and uh, this would be kind of right on, on the heels of that. So the consultant will put together that strategy, not just how to outreach to the community members themselves, uh, but also uh, the regulatory and funding agencies of uh, uh, DEQ, uh, Business Oregon, uh, the USDA, and then the Rural Community Assistance Corporation. Those are typical um, groups that are involved in wastewater funding and or regulatory elements. Uh, second piece of the, of the scope was to establish a, a Terrebonne Wastewater Advisory Committee, uh, mostly comprised of residents and business owners and other stakeholders. And, and kind of use that similar tool to I think what the board has experienced um, uh, in other projects uh, to where you have a, a focus group uh, that's, that's going to be working with the consultant group, uh, you know, and, and identifying ultimately a recommendation. You know, is this something the community can move forward with? And ideally that adds credibility to the, uh, to the process and the outcome. So, and again, it's also involving, you know, the, the regulatory agencies as well as a part of, of that. But... Um, mostly this will be business owners and community members that will be a part of that uh, advisory committee. Uh, the third item is to do a little bit of research, uh, you know, to, in order to, uh, you know, fully evaluate a new system, you really need to look at the condition of the existing systems that exist in, in each individual property. And so folks need to understand, you know, if they're dealing with a ticking time bond or if it's something that actually can be, it has more life to it, than maybe what the rumor mill uh, says it does, and then what other options may exist uh, in terms of repair uh, for those existing systems. So uh, having the consultant do some research to identify and, and really explore that particular piece. I just actually spoke to a business owner who has spent $165,000 upgrading their system. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, these are... And it's a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, number four, uh, we, we're having the consultant really kind of dust off that 1999 study, read it, review it, update it, you know, to the extent that um, the recommendation remains fairly uh, legitimate. You know, having that, uh, that step system recommendation seems, you know, to be, you know, a, a likely outcome, you know, of, of what the consultant's work here would entail. Uh, so have them uh, validate that or, or draw uh, differences to it. Update the construction costs, uh, the operation and maintenance costs, um, do the funding calculations for capital construction, and then the rate rate calculations. So as we're putting together utility, you know, it's that uh, the capital side, you know, how much does it cost to uh, construct, and then that operate in operations and maintenance cost um, that ultimately results in a rate. So these, these studies get pretty technical. Um, so that's with regard to the 1999 study. Uh, we're going to have them also in item 5 look at other technology that, uh, that has hit the market uh, since then that could be a part of either that, uh, that larger community solution uh, system, you know, full municipal system, 
um, or what, what's leading into item six, which is looking at that cluster concept that we talked about, where maybe we're not doing the full-scale tear up the town uh, uh, sewer system uh, per se, but rather dealing with uh, certain areas, uh, clusters of development. Uh, you know, we've got commercial area, we've got you know various subdivisions, um, and, and there's a, a diversity of land use in that little community that could lend itself to, to that type of uh, concept. Uh, item seven, and this is where kind of the rubber meets the road. Uh, I don't know that the county wants to be a you know a wastewater system owner operator, uh, so we got to figure out you know who can, and so we're having the consultant. Uh, look at, at various options for ownership and, and governance of uh, a future municipal system or systems there in Terrebonne and uh, come back with uh, recommendations from that as well. Finally, uh, phase two, and, and really it's, it's simply uh, putting bookends on the study, but one necessary for the regulatory and, and funding agencies, and that's providing a, a wastewater planning document uh, per the requirements of those funding agencies that we mentioned. So there's a lot of good um, direction out there already from those agencies as to what they want to see on, on the front end. Uh, when I spoke with um, some of them recently, they're more used to dealing with expansions of existing systems rather than a community doing, you know, a system out of the, out of the box. So, um, you know, there were some questions around that a little bit. But ultimately, you know, that's what we're, we're asking them to do. As far as the, and, and that's the scope of the consultant work here. Uh, we think this is an eighty to hundred thousand dollar project uh, for a consultant to do this this level of feasibility. It can be a uh, high level in, in some areas, but but needs to kind of get down in the weeds in others, especially when you're looking at cluster systems. So there's going to be some cost associated with that. Uh, there is a twenty thousand dollar grant available from Business Oregon and an application process, and I would say our chances of uh, obtaining that are likely. So we're we're twenty grand uh, to the good already, hopefully. And then uh, I think the board approved an application uh, last month uh, for a technical assistance grant uh, from DLCD. And we should be hearing about that in a few weeks, uh, early December at the latest. Uh, that's another $20,000 that could potentially be applied to this uh, project. So that leaves us with a funding gap anywhere from forty dollars to, to $60,000 uh, that, uh, that we would have to, to close and, uh, you know, prior to, to moving forward or you know, hiring a consultant. So. With that board, uh, the, the thought today was that we just uh, kind of lay out the elements of that RFP and uh, get your input on those. Uh, are we missing anything? There is, is there any other questions you would like answered through this process that we can make sure the consultant uh, addresses? And then uh, your direction on if, if you feel now's the time to, to move forward. Should we, um, you know, assuming, you know, we have a, we'll know here in a few weeks uh, with DLCD, but we'll, we'll still have a, a sizable funding gap to, to right. close, and we'll need to, to come back with a, a concept as how to pay for that. But you believe that uh, Business Oregon, the 20000 grant there is fairly likely then? It, it seemed in, in our conversations that uh, this was in their wheelhouse and we would be, um, you know, the, no assurances provided, but it seemed likely. And there's no other place we can apply for grants that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. There is a, um, you know, I should add, and as noted in the report, yeah, uh, they they do. Uh, Business Oregon does provide a, a loan option as well. Right. Um, but uh, unaware of any other feasibility study grants. Usually they're they're there to fund the the construction and the design uh, mm -hmm. portions, uh, grants and, and and those funding entities and regulatory agencies. That's where they they like to kick their dollars in when there's a, a project, but not on the feasibility side. Okay. Well, I. I um, realize that they do have a significant issue in, in the community, talking to all the owners, and you know the fact that Parker went to what is it a hundred, talked to a hundred different people, and they they were supporting at least of looking at this. You know the cluster seems to be working there, you know as far as Angus Acres goes, and then the other housing development that that they've, you know, I don't know. Um, Mr. Cleveland might have further analysis of this, but from what I've heard, that they do have a couple good systems that are now the bugs have been worked out and they're working. Yeah, so that's you know I think uh, you know will will be a, a new piece of this feasibility study that we didn't see in the past studies. Um, you know, can we do a cluster thing, and that would lend itself to more phasing and uh, certain areas jumping in and paying for it and so on. Uh, but at the same time, 
you know, what's best for the community could be that municipal system. And uh, it's, uh, you know, no one's not going to stop flushing their toilet in Terrebonne anytime soon. Uh, this is a problem that uh, will continue to exacerbate. That's just the nature of things. It does, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. It only gets worse, mm -hmm. especially when the systems are at the end of their life and you can only do so many Band-Aids. Yeah. Do you have something, Tom? Uh, commissioners, I was just going to offer, since I, I, this really doesn't fit into the operational funding of either the road department or community development, that if the board was interested in moving this forward, that we would cover whatever we are unable to fund with grants through our general fund. And I'm generally supportive of that. I mean, if we're going to kick it off, let's support the community, this discussion, and, and uh, you know, grant uh, fund f what we can from grants, but not not worry about uh, the difference at this point with resources available and the excitement uh, in the economy right now. A couple thoughts. Um, maybe a, a sentence or two at the very beginning, the introduction, uh, defining the urban unincorporated community with the goal of kind of defining the footprint, uh, knowing that you can have a community system in an in a urban un unincorporated community. Because, you know, I mean, this was an issue that I ran on in understanding rural. You don't put community systems in, but when you have an unincorporated community like this, it's allowed. So just so, and then, you know, the footprint of the water district, if that's the perimeter of the UUC, you know, maybe just defining that. So a statement or two up front. And then that, and it's probably in the, uh, uh, the previous studies, but that'll be good for and, uh, just laying it up front. Up, yeah, up. you bet. And, and attached to this, we'll have... Uh, a map of the you know the existing known information that we have certainly the boundaries of uh, the unincorporated community uh, the prior study um, uh, you know some early data yeah. on at least the number of permits that have been issued I think that, that the board saw in the in the August meeting over you know how the the failure failures have been kind of ramping up within the last five years so they'll have a, a full array of information available to them to um, to jump in and, and uh, have good understanding of Terrebonne and this would actually be the third study. Correct. And mm -hmm. isn't it third time the charm? I mean, isn't that what we're... For sure. Always. <laughs> just, well, to, just a quote. And also, so for item number two, establishing water advisory committee, um, you know, putting emphasis on that. So maybe this isn't a word change, but just me using my words. Uh, the fact that, you know, just the education of the residents, the relationships of residential and commercial, uh, making sure people understand just the scope of what we're talking about, the true costs of a system if it was, uh, you know, and this would be the outcome of this study, obviously, but uh, emphasizing that um, we want the contractor to really create that advisory committee and engage with those folks, not just here's the paperwork for a group of people to read because that would be a disconnect from what we're investing in. Um, and then it brings me back to a kind of a comp plan for Terrebonne. I don't, do we have like a comp plan section or chapter for Terrebonne, kind of the big, big picture? Uh, because as residents of the area, it's probably good for them to be able to sit back and say, okay, what have we studied? What, what do we think last time we opened it up and put it on paper? Because, uh, you know, with the transportation discussion going on, with Smith Rock being so successful with the trans, um, traffic flows through that area, you know, what, I mean, what does it look like to incorporate that area someday, which would be this committee if they said, hey, we want the mayor of Terrebonne instead of the Deschutes County Commissioners. Uh, so just the future, you know, yeah. what could be possible. Uh, for the record, Peter Gutowski, Deschutes County <laughs> Planning uh, Manager, uh, Madam Vice Chair and uh, Commissioner DeBone. So Terrebonne uh, is an unincorporated community. It, it, has a, it has a chapter in the Deschutes County Comprehensive Plan. It was last revisited in 2010, 2011. We have, as part of our work plan, uh, uh, the opportunity to re-engage not just Terrebonne but Tumalo, uh, as well as Southern Deschutes County. Uh, we recognize that it's been a decade or a soft decade, and given the factors that you've just described uh, in Terrebonne specifically, there is a recognition from, from planning staff that it, it would be important to re-engage them. Um, and there are a number of complementary policies that, that speak to, you know, the, the, the challenges of, of a growing community that warrant that revisitation. Yeah, I mean, because there's residential development, obviously, and, um, you know, more activity there. 
Um, so yeah, that would be a good follow on to this, obviously, is that your comp plan vision at some point too. So that brings me back to that advisory committee. These could be folks that really get engaged for a couple of years on many topics and, you know, this product specifically, but, you know, what's the future of Cherubon? So. Yes, what is going on in the fact that the Smith Rock numbers have doubled? What is it? In, since 2012, it's now 800,000 are visiting that yeah. state park, the second most busiest state park. So we really, yeah, it's time to re-engage, I believe, the community. So yeah, I guess maybe just a little UUC words at the very beginning of this is my only real action yeah, there, but I've said my piece. Great. So. And I'd be supportive. You know, if it ends up being a general fund, uh, you know, we can schedule it, we can plan it, and, uh, you know, we'll get the scope of what we're really talking about at some point. And that shows support for the community and the groundwater protection. I mean, that's serious business, especially if a residential commercial system has failed and there's no options for putting in the next version of it. You know, just disposal space, uh, soil depth, the whole big picture. Okay. Mr. Cleveland, did you have anything you wanted to update <laughs> us with today? Uh, Thanks for joining us. In case you needed me. We always need you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, the, yeah, the commercial zone, there, there are some concerns. We've had that repair that was recently done. That was done through DEQ. But um, it started with us because it was a commercial facility. <laughs> the health department was involved. So um, they had to repair their system. I think it was pretty expensive. Yeah. But they own other properties that um, – that they're concerned about now. I've had some discussions with, with their contractors. So the, that commercial district in Terrebonne is, you know, an area of concern for the mm -hmm. septic system. And there's opportunities if some of those concerns can be at least designed, you know, solution design, cost-effective cost long-term investments that could uh, help that area. So that board, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, issue this RFP, get it out on the street. Uh, you'll hear from us once we've got, have a, a list of proposers and a, and a budget that we can then uh, evaluate, you know, how exactly to close that, that funding gap if, if something more official needs to be done. So, Right. Okay. All right. I see. I think that's taken, what, 11 months since I was given the Terrebonne original 1999 plan and the fact that, you know, there is the need there. So thank you so much for doing that. You bet. Thank you. Todd. <laughs> 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 Yes. Well, he, we could. Huh? <laughs> oh. Now. All right. So. Madam Vice Chair, you are uh, in a position to uh, again. It's a work session topic. Just I guess to provide the transition. Uh, Kyle was astutely uh, watching the proceedings and is a position to prepare you for an outdoor mass gathering public hearing for Monday. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Good morning. For the record, Kyle Collins, Deschutes County Planning Associate Planner. Um, as Peter mentioned, um, this is a work session to prepare for public hearing next Monday. Uh, to consider a proposal by Four Peaks LLC uh, to host an outdoor mass gathering um, at a property located at 21085 Knot Road in Bend. Um, the outdoor mass gathering permit is for the 2020 Four Peaks Music Festival at the subject property. Um, this music festival has been held in Deschutes County for the previous 13 years at this point um, and three years in this specific location. Uh, so this will just be a continuation of past year's events permits. Uh, the event specifically will include overnight camping, um, parking, food and drink, and volunteers, um, estimated at around 3,000 people. That's kind of the, the maximum that they could get up to. Um, the property itself is about 150 acres. Uh, it's developed with a single family dwelling and a few accessory agricultural related structures. Uh, the dates for this specific 2020 event is proposed for June 13th through June 22nd. A majority of that is actually associated with the setup and um, site establishment for the festival itself. All the public events wouldn't begin until June 18th, 
at which point they would end on June 21st. Um, leading up between June 13th up throughout uh, June 22nd, there would be a number of volunteers camping on the subject property to provide those set of services. So there will be people um, associated with Four Peaks LLC, but no, uh, no public events prior to June 18th and then after June 21st. And we've seen that in the past with a previous application and the dates at the beginning when equipment starts being dropped off the day before. So this has been a kind of interesting bone of contention sometimes when the first people show up. Exactly. And and we're hopefully trying to encapsulate that and, and make it as publicly available mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as we can on the front end so people know that while there's things happening on the property leading up to this event, they're not necessarily associated with public access to the event. But it's five days of preparation for four days of, a, of an event. It's a, it's a three-day event, but five days of preparation. Leading but it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? It's the 18th, 19th, 20th, and then people would be packing up and leaving on the 21st. So it's more, more like three and a half days. Is are they saying here on Sunday that the gates are going to open with the music festival? On my schedule? That's correct, yeah, so. That's four days. Excuse me, yeah, Uh, June 18th is the the initial first day and then it ends on the following Sunday. Right, so that's five day prep, four days of concert. And um, I have a question on the exhibit C1. Is that to say Heidi Lane? It says the lane here with an arrow at the very, this one? Oh, in the site map? Uh Uh-huh. Correct. Okay, so. It's H E I D I height that that height lane. Okay, thank you. And the um, the site description, the map that I've provided uh, to both of you here today, um, is similar to the the site set up in, in previous years on this subject property. The majority of the events are are set up on the eastern kind of side of the property and somewhat in the central area. Access to the event itself would be from the northeast corner, off of. Uh, Heidi Lane in this case. Um, parking areas are located approximately in the, the southern and southeast corner of, of the property. So that would be where all of volunteers um, and campers associated with the festival would be staying throughout the, the public facing side of the event. Um, in their proposal, the applicant is in uh, address the requirements associated with all outdoor mass gatherings, which include insurance, uh, sanitary waste disposal facilities, the water supply, fire protection, medical services, public safety and enforcement, uh, parking facilities, and uh, alcohol and dangerous drugs, and then the, the hours of operation, which we've gone through here. Um, with their application, they have received the signatures from the following public agencies that are required uh, to sign off on these events the Ben Fire Department, uh, the Deschutes County Health Department, the Deschutes County Health Division, and finally the Deschutes County Sheriff. Um, Staff believes that the proposed outdoor mass gathering permit request um, can generally apply with the applicable standards and criteria in Chapter 816, which is uh, uh, the chapter for all outdoor mass gathering permits. If certain conditions of approval are met, and ultimately those conditions will be noted in the staff report for the public hearing next week. Uh, One thing to point out, the applicant is requesting a waiver um, from the requirement to maintain an ambulance on site during the festival. Um, This has occurred in previous years, uh, the previous five years actually, um, associated with just the siting of the on-site ambulance. So no waiver is sought for a first aid station on site, and the applicant states that uh, it will comply with county code. They've hired um, a service provided by Adventure Medics, They're kind of a, an LLC that provides these festival-type uh, medical services. So there will be trained staff on site that can use uh, defibrillators specifically and provide other necessary first aid requirements. Um, so the board can waive those permit requirements in the case of ambulance service um, if there's good cause shown by the event organizer that they've they've made to meet these additional standards. Is the insurance um, event policy is that attached here? The the insurance event policy is not attached here. Um, typically, in in previous years, we've required it as a condition of approval, just because the actual insurance itself generally isn't required until about two weeks before the right. event. 
So you don't see it until two weeks before the event is what they, you're doing? They'll generally provide us a copy of what they're proposing, but the actual who they're getting the insurance from ultimately wouldn't come forward until um, about two weeks before so the it's event. It's been a condition of approval in the past to be proven that it's in hand before the event happens. Correct. Yeah, I can note the certificate of insurance is reviewed by both risk and legal in advance of that. Um, Additionally, the public hearing, just to be clear on Monday, is not a land use hearing. This is outside of land use. And uh, this is a shall issue. So if the conditions can be outright met or conditioned to be met, the board is mandated to approve it. So it's a little different than land use. Thank you. Are there any changes in state law, outdoor mass gathering rules from last year? Uh, not to staff's knowledge. It's very much the same environment for application. Compel your question. Compel me to come up. Is uh, yeah, the state legislature Cohen. changing anything? Yeah, the, uh, we are in the. We have housekeeping amendments that include legislative amendments. Uh, that uh, it's, I don't think it's easy. That's leading that one. This is going to. Uh, Nicole was spearheading that, but is now going to go to Zechariah. But there was uh, a bill. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the number that would give counties the ability to treat outdoor mass gatherings as land use decisions. And based on our coordination with the board uh, earlier this fall, the decision was not to include that. Um, and, but there was, th th I think there was a particular county in the valley that was maybe Marion County that was contemplating uh, that type of oversight. Um, but again, it's permissive. So, and a land use decision would be approved once, and as long as the events substantially the same there's no other application process in future years is I, that I believe that? that's I I think it's going to depend on the on the application um, uh, uh, the point to, so I don't know for certain but I think if it was going to be at the same property at the same date um, given for peaks example they've they've moved properties uh, a couple of times the, the the challenge that staff expressed is that if you if with if it was subject to a land use process, if you had any kind of opposition, um, even with months of advance preparation, as as we're well aware, just with the complexities in our county, that if you have a, if you had an organized or mobilized opponent, they could litigate that yeah. process well within the yeah. the desired date. So um, there there are some challenges with uh, contemplating treating this type of use as a land use decision um, or through a land use process. But yeah, so there's discussion at the legislature yeah. and there's possible They passed a bill. Changes, but so, yeah, they passed, yeah, they passed they a law, I should say, that makes it permissible for counties to update their codes. Yeah, okay, permissible, So and we haven't taken action on Correct. it. So this is the same environment from last year. I just, yes. That's what I was wondering. Great. I believe that's uh, the, the main issues today. Um, like I said, it's it's a work session, so the the primary things will come up in the public hearing. But I would open it up to uh, the commissioners if they have questions for staff. Yeah, no questions. Okay, I know we've received several emails regarding the concert and the festival, and how people are very happy to attend. Yeah, we've uh, I believe as of today received at least five public comments related to the notice, um, all in support. Right. Okay. That's great. No, no further questions? No questions. Okay. Thank you much, Kyle. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. So did this document come from the, the um, part, submitting party then? Correct. That is okay. uh, related to the application material. All right. Thanks. Their further business. So, just traveling to uh, Association of Oregon Counties Conference, the uh, Eastern Oregon Counties Association dinner this evening. I'll be able to attend that. So, are you going to be there also? Um, no, I'm not. Yeah, so I'm going to get down to that. So I didn't realize tomorrow. today was going to be this kind of a day. So, 
I will be there tomorrow morning early for a 9 o'clock meeting. And then uh, we're going to have an open house with two candidates for Association of Oregon County's director. Oh, good. Um, and When is that going to be? Uh, I think Tuesday, after, Tuesday evening, maybe 5 or 6 o'clock. Okay. Tuesday evening? Yeah. So uh, the names are out there. So Dan Chandler is this, um, assistant county administrator from Clackamas County. And uh, Sid Lichen is a previous county commissioner from Lane County. Oh, good. So he made it to the Yeah, so that's two. the two names. We did that on Friday. I was in Salem uh, for those interviews. We interviewed four people. Okay. So, okay, that's great. So it's an open process for those two. And uh, I'll let you know. I mean, the concept is do we want to administrator – and then a strong legislative director, or, you know, with kind of more of the, the tasks of legislative lead on that director, mm -hmm. or the administrator being the legislative lead with support for legislative. You know, it's kind of the identity of AOC could be one way or the other. This is just kind of what I get down to when, I, when I'm thinking of the two candidates. Uh, it's, all, it's up for all of us as commissioners to kind of uh, – digest what we want to see from AOC because this is the the dynamic time the director uh, the COO you know Rob Van Cleve is retiring uh, and now uh, the previous legislative director isn't there so we're gonna have to hire for that position so okay we'll we'll do it together this week we'll make some decisions Great. So and this is a recruiting process if we don't have the right person we could start over or to figure out where we want to go so we've hired a profman uh, Bill McDonald is one we worked with for our fairgrounds recruitment, uh, and you know they're guaranteed to, uh, you know, the person that gets selected to be with us for a year, or they'll start a recruitment over again. Also, uh, so I mean, it's a positive environment. We we can do what we want, what's right for the organization. So, what time is that event on Tuesday? I think at five o'clock. It, it'll be on the. It's it's an official. Everything's working around that tomorrow night. Yeah. Okay. Because All that's right. such a big event. And are we having a dinner on Wednesday night? We are. Okay. And what time is that dinner? 6.30? Okay. <laughs> well, you know what? I've been reading a lot of water rights. <laughs> there you go. So I haven't really looked at my yeah. social schedule. <laughs> so that sounds great. Okay. Good. So I'm, I'll take the county ad administration explorer if, unless somebody else wanted it. I mean, I could drive my vehicle or drive that. So I'll take it down there. No, that's fine. And then that'll be available for dinner too if we're going. So we'll probably walk. So there's no. Oh, we need to walk. I'm yeah, sure, yeah. right? That's okay. Nice. Walking. Yes. Nice. That really good exercise. Okay. Sounds good. Um, what? Any other further business, Tom? Uh, no, just and we can save this till Commissioner Henderson is back. Uh, if you have a decision to make on uh, the budget committee, uh, as you know, we have a firm up every year now. The way we stagger the committee, so. Uh, Mike Meyer's term is up at the end of December, so we'll need some direction from the board on uh, whether to re-up him or um, invite him to apply in a open case or two. Okay. Okay. Great. So then timing for that would be the end of the year, first of the year kind of deal to prepare for next year's budget, if, if there was a change, I'm thinking. Uh, and uh, the reason I say that is because we have a scheduled end of the year item still for the budget committee or not? Mm -hmm. uh, it's been scheduled, yeah. It's, it's Another 12th, 11th to 12th is a budget, our, our traditional mid-year. Yeah, mid so we still have one coming with the current budget committee. That's what I was thinking. Great. Dave, do you have any further business? Bills. Eric, the homeless, how is that coming? I think fine. I know that there's been, uh, conversations and looking at the facility. Okay. All right, because I think isn't the weather supposed to get cold again this week? I think it's, it's supposed to get um, on the cold side again. I thought. I mean, maybe it was the low temperature, but it sounded pretty cold. All right, great. All right. Uh, well, yeah, um, the facility at the, uh, has been discussed with the Homeless Leadership Coalition. The, it's really the time frame is with them now to finalize their operating plans and uh, – and we can enter into a lease, but we're we're 
not holding anything up in oh, terms good. of getting that in place. So we're work, working with HLC. Okay, Colleen. Great. Right. And James. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you for this morning.